My name is Akhil. I was brought up in uh, Kenya, but I was born in India, Hyderabad. And now I'm studying in Cape Town. And uh, one of the things that I've done in Cape Town, apart from studying, of course, is uh, start a startup. Uh, so yeah, I'll definitely speak a little more about it as we go. Yeah, so I'm doing my undergrad in computer science and information systems at the University of Cape Town at the moment. Um, and I started a startup called Zio. Uh, and I'm the founder and CEO at Zio, the chief operational officer. So essentially, Zio is a platform that gamifies a student software developer's journey into gaining real world industry skills through doing coding challenges and building out prototypes for startups, which all contributes to a digital skill-based profile which can ultimately help them land their dream job. So that's a quick elevator pitch of what Zio does. And I will link it up to the conversation we're going to be having today around AI and our future. Yeah, please feel free to, um, you know, have, if you have anything to talk about, raise your hand and you know, we can have it as a conversation because I'm pretty much your age and, you know, I, wanna, I want this to be lighthearted. Okay, cool. So, yeah, if you want to add me on social media, um, at Akil Bodu. Awesome. So what is AI? Can anyone answer, like, what is AI? Exactly, yeah. Anyone else want to say, suggest anything? Pretty much automation of tasks, right? Cool. So the definition I found is that Artificial intelligence is the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. So pretty much exactly your words. Um, and this is what we'll be talking about today. So let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals of AI. So AI has pretty much been around since um, the 1950s. And um, back in the day, you know, the goal was to create computer software that will adapt and learn and make decisions. Um, but why is AI booming right now so much and not back in the day? It's because right now we have all the computational resources we need, um, all the data abundance we need, and all the algorithms, quite a few algorithms that have been created by researchers since 1950. Um, so I like to um, use a human analogy for this. So as humans, um, we're collecting data all the time um, through our senses, and we're collecting it in the form of knowledge and experience. So every time we want to make a decision, we reflect back on our knowledge and experience, and that influences the decision we make. AI is pretty much similar. It's, it's exactly how it works. Um, so to actually create an AI algorithm of your own, you need data and you need rules. These are the two fundamental things you require to create an AI algorithm. Cool, but before I go forward, I just want to clarify the differences between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. So Everything is one and the same thing. Like artificial intelligence is basically a program that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. Now machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence where it's an algorithm or model which, feed, which you feed a lot of data, which will learn from all that data to make predictions. Um, deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is also feature learning um, where uh, you sort of Okay, so the thing is, in machine learning, um, you define the variables you need to create predictions. But in deep learning, you let the algorithm figure out those variables for you and make, learn from that, those variables and make predictions based on that. So that, those are sort of the differences, because I hear a lot of machine learning, deep learning, but, and people just have sort of blurred, blurred lines between all these things. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make it clear. I hope that's clear. Cool? Right, so data. Data is so important, right? Um, can anyone tell me how many bytes are in an exabyte? Close enough. It's actually 10 to the power of 18. Um, so one exabyte has 10 to the power 18 bytes. Um, so if you look carefully in the background over here, that's actually the Library of Congress, which is the largest library in the world. Um, you can imagine the number of books there, the number of text content that's there. So now if we take all of that text content, multiply that by 100,000, we get one exabyte. Cool? 
So just to put things in more perspective, if we look at the global IP traffic, in 2015, we had 528 exabytes of data. So that big library we saw just now had one exabyte. In 2012, we had 528 exabytes. And last year, in 2017, we had 1,400 exabytes of data. That just shows that there is data abundancy. There is just a lot of data, and data is what feeds machine learning algorithms and AI algorithms. Cool, but as much as there's all of this data, it's really important that we have computational power to process all of this data, which brings me to Moore's law. Does anyone know about Moore's law? Anyone who's studying computer science, Moore's law? OK, so actually, Moore is um, uh, the founder of Intel. And um, he actually, it's, it's more of an observation than a law. And he observed that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit double every two years, right? Uh, which means that the computational power in integrated circuits double every two years. But that's changing now. We have companies like NVIDIA who are challenging these cycle times and building the, doubling the transistors in circuits almost every six months. That just shows that computational power is increasing rapidly as we go, and Moore's law is pretty much dying. And yeah, so just to touch a little bit on more of computational power, this quantum computing. Um, so if I bring it back to the analogy of the library, um, if we look at today's conventional computing technology, um, if we had to read the library uh, books in the library, we'd have to read it one by one. But if we use quantum computational technology, we can read all those books at once. That just shows the capability of the computational power at this point in time. Right, so there's a lot of computational power and it's growing rapidly. Right, so we've spoken about the abundance of data and the computational power, but I'd like you to keep this in mind as we go forward with regards to rules creation. Sure, there are algorithms out there um, that, that have been researched by many researchers, but in Africa, at least, they're not, there's not enough talent to apply these algorithms in industries. But all over the world, a lot has been happening in industry. And I'd like to touch a little more on how AI has been le leveraged in all the industries and how it's revolutionizing uh, all these different industries. So AI revolutionizing industries. How are we doing for now? Is everyone OK? Any questions so far? Awesome. Cool. Right, so let's talk about Tesla. Um, in the manufacturing sector, Tesla is using so many robots to pretty much manage the assembly process, um, which means they have automated a lot of the menial tasks that humans had to do initially with robots by training them with machine learning algorithms to be able to know what pieces to exactly assemble and to finally produce a product. That's how Tesla is using AI and all the different manufacturing companies. And if we look at Amazon's warehouse logistics, um, they have robots that actually help, help with the logistics. But over here, the robots are leveraging off human, inter human so, so they're sort of helping humans in how they work. So if I order something from Amazon, a human who's working at the warehouse logistics place would put the, the ordered items in the, in the robot's um, container, and the robot would pretty much handle the rest going forward. Like, there's a chain of robots. Um, and the delivery would, would happen. Obviously, humans do the delivery, but robots are pretty much leveraging um, the speed and accelerating the process of delivery. And that's why if you order products, they come quite quickly. Um, so that's how Amazon is leveraging off AI. And not only this, like if you look at the recommendation system, if you are buying a computer, for example, um, it's going to say suggested people bought uh, like a keyboard with the computer, right? That is AI happening there. AI is recommending. Um, all the different things that you can also buy along with the computer. So even YouTube, there's just so much that's being implemented, yeah? That's very interesting. Unfortunately, I don't know much about that, but I'll definitely check it out. Um, these are the sort of things that are revolutionizing retail. Um, this is AI is automating all these menial tasks and um, becoming so smart about how we go about retail and understanding consumer needs, um, which is very interesting. And by the, by the end of this um, conversation, I'd, I'd love it if 
you know, anyone in this room actually goes on to take an initiative to do something about it. Um, because I'm sure that all of you are coming from different backgrounds, like, you know, finance, law. Um, AI can be used to leverage any industry, really. And yeah, that's sort of the things I'll lead to. Thank you, about, thank you for that. Yeah. Cool. So AI and finance, right? Um, like Stripe and payment gateway providers are using really smart AI techniques to prevent fraud. They're preventing fraud using AI. And a lot of trading bots are being implemented by all the investment companies out there to know when exactly to invest in stocks, when, you know, when the value is higher or when the value is lower. Um, so that, that just shows that you know, jobs are being lost. Those are one of the things I want you guys to do as we go forward. Like traders are no longer needed because we have trading bots that investment companies can use, right? That's something to keep in mind. And IBM Watson. So healthcare is something close to my heart and I, I'm really impressed with what IBM Watson is doing with healthcare. Um, for medical care, for instance, IBM Watson provides so, so, social, social care and behavioral, behavioral care. Sorry guys, my pronunciation. It's a mess. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of what, health, um, what IBM does with medical care. And drug discovery is where it gets really interesting. So IBM has a lot of data, right? And they know exactly the kind of drugs, what kind of outcomes are produced from certain drugs. And they, because they can create these insights using deep learning, they can see the different kind of drugs that can be fused together to produce something that could, for example, cure cancer, right? That is how drug discovery is being accelerated using AI. And there's also cancer treatment. A lot of research that goes into cancer treatment, data is collected, mm -hmm. and efforts are also going there. And prescriptions. So because you know, they're tracking what kind of um, patients that have been diagnosed are prescribed what kind of medicines, because the, they have the data on that, they can also predict. So if I go to um, like, a, like a hospital and I have... I've been diagnosed with something, and I am I'm suggested medicines, right? Um, AI, this IBM Watson can pretty much prescribe what exactly you need to cure yourself. Um, that is because they have data, so it all comes down to the data. So that's how IBM Watson is um, revolutionizing healthcare, and also, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what other companies are doing much around healthcare. Anyone else have any suggestions around anyone doing a lot in healthcare? Cool. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic. Yeah. And aerobotics. So aerobotics is actually a startup in, uh, based out of Cape Town, and they're doing a lot in agriculture. They're using drone imagery to uh, detect pests and diseases to help farmers accelerate the process of, um, you know, creating output. And, you know, the moment they detect, like, there's some disease, they can rectify it immediately. So they're helping farmers as well. Cool. So any questions so far, guys? Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the fourth industrial revolution. I know that um, you guys are having a talk today around that, and um, this is just really high level. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Um, but yeah, anyone want to describe the industrial revolution? Okay, at least the third industrial revolution, maybe? Cool. So the third re industrial revolution, sorry, someone going to answer? Yeah, so that's the third industrial revolution, right? The fourth industrial revolution is where we're using technologies such as the Internet of Things, VR and AR, to leverage industries. Um, so that's Industry 4.0. And as we go into the fourth industrial revolution, um, oh, well, sorry about that. I just wanna, I, I wanna, I want you, I want, I want you guys to really register this slide. Uh, so we have a data abundancy and we have computational power, but rules creation, the skills. Um, do we have the skills to apply AI in all these industries today? As we go into the fourth industrial revolution, we need skills to be able to leverage these industries. And there is, unfortunately, a skills shortage, at least in Africa, and also all over the world. I have gathered some stats on that. 56% of senior AI professionals believed the lack of qualified AI professionals was the single biggest barrier to AI implementation across business operations. Another stat, 300,000 AI professionals worldwide, but millions of roles are available. That's because a lot of companies 
are using AI to drive their businesses. So there is, unfortunately, a huge skills shortage. But also there's the fear of taking jobs away. Um, you know, Tesla, for instance, has automated a whole bunch of tasks. Amazon has automated a whole bunch of tasks. You know, robots are replacing humans. That's the fact, like jobs are being lost, especially being in Africa. It's unfortunate that, you know, a lot of people from townships get these sort of jobs that are being automated by robots. It's really unfortunate. But although jobs are being taken away and AI's goal is to mimic human behavior, AI struggles to mimic humans in creativity. Sure, there are some algorithms that are, they are creating art, creating music, but creating at the level of humans is a little bit challenging for AI. Definitely. See, AI is also getting there, but the point is that doing it at the, at the level of humans is still a little bit of a challenge, but it's getting there. Um, and also critical thought, um, and also love and empathy. So now, those are things that AI struggle to mimic humans at. Um, yeah. So, you know, this is, this is a quote I want to leave you guys with. Like, don't jump in front of the train, let's rather ride along. Just say that AI is replacing jobs doesn't mean that, you know, we'll say no to AI and, you know, just stop it, right? We can't do anything about it. Like Facebook, Google, Amazon, IBM, they have tons of data. They're pretty much responsible for running the internet, right? And they're driving AI. There's no way we can stop it right now. So the best thing to do going forward is to get those skills you need to guide AI in the right direction and control that and leverage all the different industries in a positive way and create a positive impact and welcome the new opportunities that will come along. Because sure, AI will be automating a few tasks, taking a few jobs away, open up new opportunities. We saw that with the third industrial revolution where the introduction of computers introduced new opportunities. And that's how you know, all the other new technologies have come up, right? And that's where I'll talk about Zyro. So yeah spoke about Zio. Zio is basically a platform that gamifies a student software developer's journey into gaining real world industry skills through doing coding challenges and building out prototypes for startups, which all contributes to a digital skill based profile that can help them land their dream job. Right. So essentially, we're creating a pool of highly skilled developers in all these different journeys. Right. So when I say journey, I mean like web development, web development is a journey, Android is a journey. AI is a journey, blockchain is a journey, right? So at Zio, we encourage these conversations to happen. We've had so many talks around AI, around blockchain. In fact, we've had workshops on blockchain and hackathons also on blockchain. And we're trying to create these skills so that people like you can take charge and you know guide the changes in the positive direction. That is the goal, right? So yeah, sign up on Zio.io. But <clears throat> just to reiterate again, don't jump in front of the train, let's rather ride along. Get those AI skills you need, guide the changes that happen in AI, and create a positive impact within your societies, and educate to welcome the new opportunities that come along. People shouldn't be shocked when new opportunities are coming along. We need to keep educating people about the things that are out there, and welcome AI and guide it in the right direction. So, join me on my journey, to creating a positive impact through driving useful solutions in industry. Which also sort of ties into Zio's vision. Um, Zio's vision is to cultivate young leaders that will drive the future of African tech innovation. Thank you. Any questions, guys? Yeah, AI security is definitely a booming industry. For instance, fraud prevention, a lot of effort is going into, you know, coming up with technologies that actually um, safeguard a lot of systems. Um, but also there's a shortage in that field. So yeah, that's one of my takes, yeah. Anyone else? Awesome, so that's a very good question. Um, I think it's a combination of the government and the private sector, right? Um, so the government sure is trying to do, trying to put in some effort into that. In fact, 
um, I was actually invited to uh, one of the conferences in Joburg. Um, it was the National Advisory Council of Innovation. It was a government-hosted workshop where they were speaking about the new technologies that they can welcome in 2020. Um, so there is some sort of effort going into that. But the thing with governments is that um, systems so sort of uh, grow slowly, right? The private sector, because they can dive vertically into problems and solve them really quickly, um, private sectors have that advantage. So I think private sector and government should leverage off each other's resources to drive the changes that will happen in the future. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, although we have all this data, um, firstly, there's bias in the data. Secondly, it's unstructured. So when you're creating AI models, you need structured data or you need unstructured data. You can use unstructured data, but you need to clean it to a very large extent to create useful information out of it. But bias is something that cannot be avoided. Bias is there in humans, right? And that's why we, we sort of rely on you know research papers and all that sort of data. Um, but that is something that cannot be avoided. The data is pretty much um, used to create the predictions. So these are, some things. these are definitely some things you should consider when you are gathering data to create your models. Yeah, that's true. That actually happened. And Sundar Pichai, the CEO, had to give a statement about it as well. Yeah. That's true. Look, AI is using data, right? Um, and you can use this data to come up with diabolical intentions. Like, you can come up with ve like very evil um, models that do evil things, like Terminator 3 things, right? Um, but um, that's why, you know, there's a lot of open source initiatives to make sure that AI is open to everyone and it's not centralized to any particular group. Um, and that's why, you know, as much as AI will be taking jobs away, which I think is one of the biggest problems about AI, right? Which Elon Musk probably considers as well, which is why he called it the end, right? Um, even though jobs will be taken away, it's about creating that culture around AI, you know, because it's happening. Like, we can't stop it right now, right? That's a good point, yeah. These are the repercussions that could come off. And that's why we need people who will come up with solutions to these repercussions. Um, I don't have the answer to everything, but that's definitely um, a problem that can come up. But also, like, the solution is AI as well. I think there are initiatives that the government is taking right now by working, for, for instance, there's this youth employment service um, initiative, the YES initiative, that's driving skills, right? In Cape Town, there's um, capacity that has like skills workshops where they, they, just, they just have a whole bunch of workshops and it's just, it's completely free and they're just driving skills. Um, so efforts are being made there. So I think one of the coolest things about AI, there's just a whole ton of resources out there to get started. Um, and I think at Zio, um, the problem with, okay, sure, there's a lot of resources, but the problem with having all these resources, you don't know what's best for you. Um, so one of the things, that's one of the challenges that Zio are facing, right? We want to uh, provide those resources in the right manner to get you as fast as possible upskilled to build solutions. Um, so that's sort of what we're trying to create as well. Um, I'm not going to disclose any of our partners, but we are sort of also being involved in a few uh, partnerships where we're helping people from townships as well get those skills. People from townships don't know anything about um, computers and stuff. So that's where it begins, right? We start with computers and then we give them the basic skill sets, uh, basic fundamental topics in computer science and mathematics to get them started with AI. Um, and it sort of steps in from there. And those are the sort of things we're curating. So I think to answer your question, sign up on zio.io. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, that's sort of, as much as we're leveraging students who are doing computer science, we will also curate journeys for people who have no idea about computer science. Um, 
So that's the goal, right? We don't want to create any barriers for anyone who wants to learn something. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest barriers, having pre-requirements to be able to come on and do something. Um, but there are also quite a few good courses on Udemy to help you get started that don't require um, you know, having like, a lot of background in computer science. Well, obviously, it helps. It makes the process a lot faster. There will be a steeper learning curve if you don't know much from computer science, but you can still start. It's, it's hard to quantify time, but there are two things that I want to talk about that, that just sparked in my mind. Boston Dynamics. Has anyone heard of Boston Dynamics? Um, uh, if you guys are on Facebook, you probably saw like a robot jumping on a pole and jumping down and doing tumbles and stuff. Um, Boston Dynamics is the company that's doing that sort of stuff. These are the sort of companies that are driving us towards that rabbit hole, right? Um, but that's why we need more professionals to guide it in the right direction. And then also another thing that came to my mind is a project that Facebook was doing around how um, machine learning, actually deep learning models, were communicating with one another um, in, without human understanding. So like the models were created and they were communicating with one another and we had no control over what's happening between those models. How scary is that? <laughs> yeah, but that project was actually stopped. See, that means the fact that it was stopped shows that, you know, um, at least, you know, it's, it's not going to go towards the diabol diabolical side. Yeah. Thank you so much oh. for coming to speak to us today. Thank you. Informative and oh. scary at the same time. Oh, I, take, oh. I wish you all the best with your business and your space. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Thank you.